refreshing your browser. Hopefully that solves the problem. You can restore windows using the buttons at the bottom of your screen. And of course, the size of each window is also adjustable. I should just mention as well, if you are tweeting about this, please use the hashtag Bloomberg Invest. Now, we do want this to be an interactive event, which means I'm going to be throwing out some polling questions uh, throughout the series. You'll see those questions pop up on your screen as I'm talking. Please take a moment to look at them and register your responses. Here comes the first one right now. The question is, will equity markets get more volatile in the fourth quarter? You have three options here. Yes, the storm is far from over some but not as severe as earlier this year or finally very little markets have priced in most scenarios uh, have a minute or two to think about your responses enter them into the system and i'll be bringing you our collective answer after our first interview now speaking of that interview let's head over to it now uh, a short while ago i caught up with carson block the founder of Muddy Waters. I started out by asking him about the Wirecard scandal, which Germany's financial regulator has, of course, now labeled a complete disaster. Carson has previously called the entire German financial establishment Moscow on the mine. Here's what he had to say. I've been amused by the, uh, the comments from um, Boffin and the, uh, the head of Boffin and the uh, Minister of Finance in Germany because I mean, Boffin was the most powerful accomplice Wirecard had. And I don't mean that in a facetious way, all right? But for Boffin, this company, the market cap would never have gotten the $24 billion. But for Boffin, investor losses never would have been the many billions of euros that they are. And but for Boffin, they would not have raised net 2.5 billion euro from the market. Boffin was the accomplice. So what does this mean? Look, Germany is a tough one to understand. What it should mean is that the guy you quoted is going to be looking for a job next week. That's what it should mean. And there are a bunch of other people from Boffin who should be looking for jobs also. Whether that actually happens, I don't know. But um, all the warning signs were there. The first warning was publicly made in 2008, then again in 2016, then in 2018, and in 2019. And every single person who spoke out about Wirecard was placed under criminal investigation. So what does this mean for my friends in Moscow on the mine? I hope it means there's going to stop being Moscow on the mine. But... Um, you know, since they view, you know, hedge funds and private equity as locusts, although we have to say there were three journalists who were put under criminal investigation too. I don't know. They, they need to reform or else their capital markets. I mean, I, I think their capital markets are hiding other serious wrongdoers. The, the thing with Germany is that we think of it as a high, as a law abiding society. It is generally, it's a high trust environment. And when you have that type of environment where people can assume that everybody else is following the rules, that's when some really bad behavior can flourish in broad daylight. And that's why they need to have a competent regulator. And so hopefully they'll work on those reforms. Mm. I believe you exited your own wire card short. Uh, why did you do that? And what does it say about maybe the difficulties of the short selling model? So yeah, we, we were short Wirecard briefly in 2016 after I think the first Zatara report. And we, I, I can't recall how long we held it, but the thing is it became clear to us. And that was also through our own dealings in Germany, where in 2016, we shorted a company there called uh, Stroyer. And the German authorities have been similarly unkind to us as they have to all of the wire card critics over the year, over the years. So the way that I started thinking about it was being short wire card was effectively being long regulatory competence in Germany. And I just wasn't willing to make that bet. Now, I wish we'd been short recently, obviously. And what I missed was that EY was actually going to show up and do the job that investors think that they're there for. Um, you know, for the first time in, in 
the, you know, I think the entire public life of uh, Wirecard. But um, that's what I missed. And looking back on it, it's interesting because EY has had a really bad run of things, which is why I think there was probably pressure from global headquarters on the German affiliate to actually dig into this. And it's kind of amazing that, you know, two phone calls to two bank CEOs in the Philippines yielded, or would have yielded, oh, no, this, you know, there are no accounts here. Um, you know, for all these years, EY never did that work. But um, that's what I missed was that EY, you have luck in, you have EY NMC, which, you know, we exposed in December and uh, is already delisted. It EY auditing Burford, which not necessarily, we don't, we don't think it's a fraud from a legal perspective, but um, highly aggressive accounting. And that's something that we went public on last year in August. So I think EY is just having one of those really bad runs that, you know, the big four are prone to, or each of the big four are prone to from time to time. And they, they tightened up the audit procedures slightly in this case. Uh, since you point out that we, we have seen a lot of audit failures recently, I mean, Wirecard, Carillion, NMC, a, a bunch of others, uh, what would you like to be done at the audit industry to, uh, I, I guess, reform it or avoid this problem in the future? And is it specifically an Ernst & Young problem, or do you see this as a wider issue? Well, the, the thing is, investors, investors make it mistakenly assume that auditors are there to perform anti-fraud functions. That's actually, it's, and I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny about this, but that's not what auditors actually do. So if senior management and management prepares the accounts, so if senior management is committing fraud, then the professional standards of the audit profession will exculpate auditors from liability in most situations. And the other thing that, the, that we've allowed the audit industry to do that really allows this laxity to continue. Um, well, I guess backing up for a moment, like I said, most, invest most investors do believe that auditors are performing an anti-fraud function. They also believe that the big four brand has some real value to it. And auditors do market themselves to the public as, as having, you know, big four auditors anyways, having a really strong brand that means something. And when there's no problem, People and money flow freely throughout the global structures. But the way that they set these up legally after Enron is that you have independent, well, supposedly independent entities in each country and sometimes multiple, enti multiple entities per country. And so in good times, people and money are flowing freely throughout the structure. As soon as there's an audit failure, then all of a sudden it's, oh, no, 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 no. Don't come to EY Europe over this or EY US. No, that, those are the guys in, uh, those are the guys in, uh, in Germany or you know, those are the guys in uh, China. Mm -hmm. And so the financial responsibility, we've allowed them to create this legal fiction that enables them to firewall financial responsibility for these screw ups. But again, that's not in the marketing materials or the commercials that they show during golf tournaments. So I think the first, I think, you know, I, I really think there's a cogent argument that can be made that investors are better protected against fraud if there aren't audits, because audits provide a false sense of security. And what audits really are there for is to ensure that accounting standards, the proper accounting standards are used, they're applied properly, but the reality has become that auditors effectively view management as their clients. And when management wants to be aggressive, you know, auditors are really there saying, well, how can we work with you? Um, an example is a company that we shorted in April, a US company called eHealth, also an EY audit client. Um, their accounting, the way that they apply this new accounting standard, a relatively new accounting standard, ASC 606, we think is very aggressive. And we think this is a stock promotion. So they, their revenue, they're recognizing three years of revenue each time they sign up a customer. And then they go out and tell the market, oh, value us on a multiple of revenue. Guess what? Insiders sell a lot of stock. Um, surprise, surprise, because the market has taken them up on this proposition. But we understand, and I haven't been able to confirm this, but in one of our conversations with the senior exec, former senior executive from eHealth, 
we understand that it was actually EY that went to management and said, oh, by the way, this ASC 606 is going to come into effect. This is something you could probably adopt for the business and book all this future revenue. So that's really what an auditor is there for. They're there to make management happy. They're not there to protect shareholders. This actually reminds me of something I wanted to ask you, which is how much of your research is based on public information versus tips or um, sort of proprietary research that you undertake? <laughs> well, so you know, in, in my business, when you're buying and selling securities, you have to be very careful about the word tip because there's legal significance to that. Uh, but sure. in terms of, um, I mean, so how do we source ideas? Well, I don't think we've, we've never gotten an idea, at least not one we've taken seriously from a current employee of a company. I don't think we've ever gotten an idea that we've taken seriously from a former employee of a company. Um, a lot of the way we generate ideas is we're looking for things that seem too good to be true, stock charts that have done this, poke at it a little bit, you know, is it really, I mean, in our view, nothing is as good as it seems, but the question really becomes, is the delta between perception and reality this or is it that mm -hmm. so um we also follow around people who've been involved in promotions and aggressive accounting and uh blow-ups and and frauds in the past so that's another way that we identify companies and then sometimes it's conversations with investors who are already short a given name and they and they you know they pitch us on the idea so mm -hmm. Um, and then other times it's conversations with investors who just say, you know, I had a really weird meeting with the CFO, maybe the kind of thing you guys would be into. So, um, I, you know, a few different ways of doing it, but we don't usually set up screens and look for ratios that are out of whack because I just feel like it's, you get a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives that way. And it's not the best use of our time. All right. Well, let's talk about one of your ideas, uh, GSX. Do you still have a short position on the company and are you planning on releasing any new materials or new reports? So we do still have a, a short in GSX. And you know, as a result, I've been having conversations with investors recently, of course, because it's a big enough position that, you know, they're noticing uh, when it mm -hmm. closes up, but this is nothing we haven't seen before. I mean, it, it looks a little like NQ mobile back in the day for us. Um, but yeah, we have additional research. Uh, we do intend on, on saying more, but I, I mean, it's also kind of a strange situation because I don't think the problem is that we failed to convince anybody. I think that the stock is doing what it's doing for technical reasons. And I think that there's, you know, we understand that there's a lot of support through the options markets. You could see that somebody's kind of reliably jamming it into the close most days. Um, then also it looks like, um, you know, a brokerage firm that's close with the company pulled a bunch of borrow. Then, you know, of course, what's probably a very friendly brokerage firm in Shanghai put out a strong buy and had a guy named Guy Gentile, you know, blogging about a short squeeze last week. And, you know, Guy is one of the more questionable characters in uh, U.S. markets. So, I mean, the you know, somebody seems to be pulling out all the stops here to keep the stock price elevated. But at the end of the day, it's a fake company. And there are two things that can happen with a fake company. One, it can be acquired or two, it collapses. Mm. And especially once the fake company is exposed. And I don't think this thing gets acquired. Back in the early days of China fraud, the China fraud 1.0 days, there were these zeros that were acquired. I mean, Harbin Electric, and I mean, there's a whole list of them. But the amount of money needed to buy those was much less than what would be needed to buy this. And the other thing that's going on here is the political environment um, in terms of China listings in the US is so much different now. And I feel like this is GSX jumping the shark because the more the stock ramps, mm -hmm. it really starts to look and feel a lot more like a massive middle finger pointed at Washington. And I just don't think that's the smart thing to do in this environment. And if the CSRC is serious about proving 
that it can regulate these companies and that it's that the U.S. shouldn't be up in arms about the new securities law that confers exclusive jurisdiction for investigations and discipline upon the CSRC, then the CSRC should start looking into this and, and frankly, cracking some skulls. If they don't do it, it's going to reinforce the perception that a lot of us here in the U.S. have, and that is the CSRC is not intending to be a serious regulator of U.S. listed China companies. Well, can we talk about the CSRC uh, for a minute and uh, the sort of relationship with the U.S. at the moment? Do you see scope for cooperation between the CSRC and uh, U.S. regulators or bodies like the, uh, the PCAOB? Look, the, it's, it's been pretty clear to me, to people in the U.S. government for some years that China has no real intention of cooperating with the U.S. authorities. Um, you know, they, they, they correctly gambled that the Obama administration would take this, off the, take this off the strategic economic dialogue list if they signed the memorandum of understanding with the PCAOB. I mean, you know, look, I knew people who were commissioners at, the, at Peekaboo at the time. Nobody expected much from that MOU. And, and yet I think everybody still managed to have their ex expectations disappointed. So um, China is to date has not shown any good faith in these matters. And I'd be pretty surprised if it does in the future. All right, let's talk about the market more broadly. I'm curious what it's like to be a short seller when we've just witnessed the biggest global economic hit in decades and we still have stocks trading at very, very lofty valuations. Yeah, well, I, I smile a little wryly because, you know, we did very well in March um, and most of almost all of our P&L in a given year is going to come from trading activist, short activist campaigns. Um, and so March was probably the easiest money we ever made because we didn't have to go out and start any fights with companies. And, you know, I, but I honestly, I actually felt, it's weird, I felt really bad because we're making money. I know that the, the citizenry around the world is being decimated and that the bottom is falling out of the economy. And I felt bad you know, in a way, making a good amount of money in that environment. And well, April cured that because we gave a decent bit of it back. So that's what being a short seller has been like. Um, I mean, jokes aside, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's really depressing to see what has happened to markets. And I don't disagree with the monetary stimulus at this point in time. But what I disagree with is what I'm sure is going to happen in the future. And that is we're not going to get rid of it. I mean, going into this, we have 10 years of emergency monetary policy and policymakers and particularly the central bankers have warped markets. I, mean, I, I, I see things on a micro basis and we have seen for years coming out of the global financial crisis, just massive capital misallocation. You know, my name is SoftBank for one, but um, it's, you know, I mean, we're, we're going we're gonna to repeat the cycle. And what happens is it's just blowing bubbles. It makes everything more fragile. I mean, when all these companies' balance sheets were cracking in March, you know, the relatively small number of us who actually short stuff are looking around and saying, yeah, we've been saying this for years. This is why you don't encourage risk taking, you know, well beyond, uh, you know, when the recovery has started. So, um, I mean, as far as being a short seller, look, when these things go up, it obviously doesn't feel great, but I think a lot of us who do this are really emotionally invested in, in pure markets, actually. And it's just, you know, it's just really depressing to see markets fail to serve their economic purpose, which is capital allocation and become really an engine of increasing inequality. Because if you own financial assets, when these things happen three years down the line, or hell in this case, three months down the line, you're great. Everybody else in the world and other 90% is much worse off. 
and now you can go and buy their assets at fire sale prices. So this is not sustainable. Um, uh, you know, and, and, that, and I also worry about that. Do you adjust your own strategy at all? Because it feels to me like you built the business targeting frauds that were very vulnerable to a drying up of capital, you know, companies that needed lots of capital coming in to maintain their growth strategies. In the current environment, there's no shortage of capital. Um, is that a factor for you now? Well, you can't really compare us to, say, Jim Chanos. Um, because I mean, so short selling is a niche and we are a niche of a niche. So we are going to speak as a firm, you know, four to six times a year about what we think are some of the most egregious offenses in the capital markets. I mean, they're, you know, they have to be liquid enough for us and there has to be borrow, but um, that, you know, those, those offenders um, are still here in droves. And what I think happened in the, in the financial crisis or the recovery from the financial crisis, and it was happening in the lead up to it as well, but I really think that the, uh, the, the morphine of monetary stimulus and of, of everything going up has just, I, I think it has led in, for reasons aside from inequality, but I, I think it's led to, led to some unraveling of social contract and that investor market participants, especially managements, I think man, a lot of managements, you know, CEOs started feeling like it's their God given right to be able to sell $50 million worth of stock a few years after getting the CEO chair at a given company. And that has led to just aggressive accounting, misrepresentation, sell side is completely co-opted, you know, gee, tell us by what metrics you want to be measured this quarter. And we'll forget about the ones from last quarter because they're probably not that good. Can you make up a new definition of EBITDA while we're at it? Yes, thank you. That's a sickness and that's not markets serving their purpose of allocating capital efficiently. So, um, you know, I, 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 th I think that game is just gonna continue. So what does that mean? There will be more potential shorts with more market cap for us. But what I had noticed in the past few years is that the bar for for what investors would care about in terms of problems at companies kept going up. I mean, investors were anesthetized to risk. And I guess that's one of the things that I really rue about this moment is that that, anesth that anesthetization is like paying off because they experienced a moment of, oh, you know, maybe I need to pay attention to, you know, footnotes and things that could matter in a bad situation to, <laughs> You know, I said that, come on, you know, I must have been drunk. So I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I have a hard time really thinking about what the future of, you know, markets in the, you know, near, medium and long term is, is going to be. What do you think about retail participation in the market at the moment? Because it does feel like with all the liquidity flooding into the system, we have seen a bunch of uh, new entrants, uh, people trading on Robin Hood, some people trading options. Uh, I was looking at the leaderboard of Robin Hood positions before we had this conversation and luck in coffee is, is pretty high up on that. Uh, what do you think about what's going on? You know, look, and if the SEC didn't throw the flag, Hertz probably could have done a placement. Um, I mean, this is certainly not value creating <laughs> capital allocation that we're seeing. Um, you know, probably hard lessons are going to be learned. But then again, if nothing is ever allowed to go down again, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, Dave Portnoy is far smarter than I am. And, you know, I'm just working and trying way too hard at, at making money in the market. So I don't know. I mean, look, the rational me and maybe the me that's schooled in the old way of doing things thinks that this will lead to a trail of tears. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, a lot of us have been saying, you know, we thought we had our, you know, those of us who were naysayers, again, we thought we had our moment of vindication in March um, when we saw all these balance sheets crumbling and funding market seizing. And, you know, for a moment in time, you know, we got to feel like we were really smart. And here we are feeling like, the joke's on us. So um, I don't know. 
I want to touch uh, very quickly on NMC, another successful short for you. Uh, what inspired you to go into the UAE market in particular? That's a really tough market for criticism, really, really strong defamation laws. Uh, what led you to that market? And also, do you see yourself entering uh, new markets, maybe moving away from China when you're on the lookout for potential frauds? Well, okay, so look, you know, I, NQ Mobile said, I mean, they lied about everything, so it was probably a lie, but they said back in 2013, 2014, that they had sued me for defamation in, in mainland China. Um, so for all I know, there's a defamation judgment for, you know, trillion dollars outstanding for me in China. I, I don't really care uh, about that. And, you know, if they sued me in UAE and they got, you know, a billion dollars and, you know, my head to be severed, I don't think I would care that much either because I'm not going there. There, there are certain trade-offs that I make in this business. And I know that when we short a company that has a serious base of power or, you know, has contact somewhere, there are a lot of countries I've crossed off the list of traveling to. Um, and so UAE is one of them. So I wasn't bothered by that. Now it, it was a, it was a FTSE 100 company listed in London and, what got us interested in it, and it's a name that had popped up on our radar a couple of years ago, I think conversations with investors in the UK pointing out, eh, it seems too good to be true, the margins are too high, dodgy management. Um, and um, what got us interested was actually last August when we shorted Burford, which was listed in London. And I sent out a tweet the day before um, we, we went public with our Burford campaign. And I wrote that, um, you know, tomorrow morning, uh, we'll be releasing a report 8 a.m. London time on an accounting fiasco, or something like that. And um, Burford dove, Burford went down uh, almost 20% at one point on that non-specific tweet. But there, was, there were two other stocks that dove, one of which was NMC. And I think NMC went down seven or 8%. And we were really fascinated first and foremost by the Burford reaction. And when I saw that, you know, what I, the analogy I came up with was that Burford's like this train and everybody's partying on the train, but they know that the train's going off the cliff and the name of the game is they just want to jump off right before, well, if they can, right before it goes over the cliff. And so a lot of them thought that my tweet was the signal to do so. And I think, so that's my, that's my interpretation of that behavior. But when a bunch of investors from, or long holders of NMC did the same thing, well, that basically told us we need to look closely at NMC. And when the, the first thing that jumped out to us was um, NMC seemed to be taking pains to deny that it was using supply chain financing but if you, or reverse factoring, but if you Googled and you kind of went through, you know, several search return pages, you would see that it is issuing paper or it was issuing paper that was included in supply chain financing funds. So right away we thought, okay, you know, there's a, this is going to really hit management credibility. I mean, it was pretty low hanging fruit, but B, why would they, why would they be lying about that? Um, and so, yeah, we dug in and we, and we looked at some of these transactions like the Bright Point Hospital and pretty quickly figured out that the contractor for that was an undisclosed related party. And, you know, and the, and the construction cost was probably 3X, you know, the reported construction cost was probably 3X what it should have been. So, yeah, they just, you know, pretty quickly fell into place and we're thinking, yeah, these are our kind of guys, definitely are. And what about uh, focusing more on other markets outside of China in the future? Is that the future? Well, you know, since I'd say since 2014 or so, China has only been 20, 25% of what we do. Um, I'm fond of saying that China is to stock fraud what Sil as Silicon Valley is to technology. So if you like shorting frauds, you're going to always be paying attention to China. Mm -hmm. So I, I expect that in general, it'll be like I said, roughly 20, 25%. Um, I mean, the markets in which we're active, Canada, US, UK, Japan, a little bit, um, like to 
you know, we struck out once in Japan and we hit a single once in Japan. So I'd like to build upon our brand in Japan and understand really how to communicate investment theses better to Japanese. Um, and yeah, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and continental Europe. I mean, we've, it's funky. Um, we did one thing in France. We did one thing in Germany. The French and the Germans both reacted quite poorly. Um, the AMF raked us over the coals for four years. And in December actually announced that despite they're spending a lot of money and I mean, they must have, cause I think we spent one and a half million dollars on legal fees ourselves. Um, that they weren't taking any action. And I, you know, and look, that's because we do things legally. There was, it's not like we got away with it, but up until that moment, I wasn't exactly dying to jump back into France. Um, still not, but you know, if there's something that's compelling enough and we feel like we can budget a couple million dollars uh, in legal fees and, you know, and that there's enough left over to make us and our investors feel like it was worth it, then, you know, then we'd be interested in, I now put Germany in the same bucket, um, even though, you know, that's, that's been much in many ways, a stranger experience than France, um, on the regulatory front, but, uh, yeah, there's a price for everything. So we'll, we'll see about continental Europe. All right. Well, we've come full circle to a wire card. It seems, I think that's a good place to leave it. Carson Block. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. All right, that was Carson Block of Muddy Waters, of course. And shortly after we recorded that interview, we had news that the former Wirecard CEO, Marcus Braun, had been arrested by the German authorities. Now, I should just mention that GSX has previously denied Muddy Waters allegations. We contacted them again after that interview, and they said in a statement that Muddy Waters clearly lacks a basic understanding of the Chinese education sector. From the report they published, we believe they only spent limited time and effort efforts on investigating us. We also reached out to Guy Gentil of daytraderpro.com. He said in a statement that he's a short-term and technically driven trader who recognized a squeeze in GSX stocks and traded it as such. All right, now you heard Carson talking about those overvalued stock markets just then. Let's take a look at the results of our first polling question. As a reminder, the question was, will equity markets get more volatile in the fourth quarter? The results are in 51% of you say that yes, the storm is far from over. That is closely followed by the 45% of you that say some volatility, but not quite as severe as earlier in the year. And just 3% of you say that the volatile times are over and that markets have priced in all the scenarios. So we have a, a pretty bearish or perhaps realistic bunch with us today. Now, speaking of polling questions, let's get over to our second one right now. Please take a look at your screens. The question is, will investors commit more money to ESG? You knew there was gonna be an ESG question in this, didn't you? The uh, options are, yes, they will, as long as the returns are good. Maybe, but the returns need to improve and not really, it will remain a niche portfolio priority. So uh, please take a look at those options. I should just clarify that the first option there should be, yes, they will commit more money. So your response options are yes, maybe, and no. Okay, now speaking of ESG, let's get over to our next interview. My colleague and head of Bloomberg Live, Malika Kapoor, spoke to Henry Fernandez, the chairman and CEO of the giant benchmark index provider, MSCI. Take a listen. Henry, great to see you. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Henry, the Hong Kong Exchange recently announced it's launching an Asia and Emerging Markets Futures and Options contracts under a license deal with MS, MSCI with, with you. Why did you pick Hong Kong? Well, we saw in Hong Kong was a combination of uh, very strong factors that led us to this decision. Uh, one, a, a large customer base, including international investors, regional ones, and Chinese investors. Secondly, a very large and deep pool of liquidity. Uh, thirdly, an ability to build an ecosystem, not only uh, of, of exposures around the world, but also very importantly, a greater China ecosystem combining 
uh, in futures contracts uh, exposures to Taiwan, to Hong Kong, and to the various types of investments in China, such as you know, China overseas investments versus China Asia investments. Uh, and also not only uh, listed futures, but also options. And, uh, and then lastly, and, and very importantly, the ability to, uh, to develop uh, structured products and uh, over-the-counter uh, derivatives by our clients uh, of those listed uh, options. As you know, Hong Kong is uh, the largest, if not one of the largest uh, structured product markets uh, in the world. But this is a very interesting time for Hong Kong, and there are many within the financial community who are concerned about what China's national security law means for the future of Hong Kong. Uh, the protest, we are still continuing to see uh, some of them in this, uh, in this city. How concerned are you about the future of Hong Kong? Well, I've been going to Hong Kong and China and the rest of Asia for over 40 years. So I, heard, I have heard this story before, you know, many times as to uh, the demise and, and the relevance of Hong Kong one way or another. Uh, and it hasn't happened. Every time Hong Kong comes back stronger, more resilient, reinvents itself. Uh, I believe uh, strongly in the future of Hong Kong as a financial center, international financial center. And in our case, clearly we're looking to uh, see Hong Kong as a major international risk management uh, center. A lot of it is not only because uh, the rest of the world will need Hong Kong to access China, regardless of geopolitical tensions, China will continue to be a large economy, a very large financial markets in China, and therefore international investors will want to be in China, and Hong Kong is one of the gateways, if not the gateway, to do that. China would also need Hong Kong because, uh, because they will need a place where there is more advancement currently of, uh, of trading, of, uh, you know, of laws and systems and regulations. So both parties will need Hong Kong one way or another, regardless of all the other tensions. You believe in the future of Hong Kong, but we've been polling our audience here in Asia, and there are more people who believe that Hong Kong's loss will be Singapore's gain, as in Singapore is going to become sort of the next financial destination in Asia. And you recently walked away, or you're walking away from a 23-year partnership with the Singapore Exchange. Why did you decide to walk away from Singapore Exchange or could you have continued that partnership while also pursuing a partnership with Hong Kong Exchange or was it exclusive? No, we don't do exclusives uh, with any of our uh, partners. And we always believe that uh, we need to earn and our partner needs to earn the business day in and day out. Uh, but we also believe in very strong relationships and we do not like uh, pitting one party against another. So it had to be, uh, in our case, with this uh, licensing, either Hong Kong or Singapore. Hong Kong is a very fine and great financial center and will continue to prosper, for sure, in years and decades to come. What we saw in Hong Kong was those attributes that I mentioned before, and especially, as China becomes a bigger factor in the international financial system, Hong Kong, of course, being closer to China or being part of China in the uh, one country, two systems uh, method, it, we wanted to be there. Based on the MOU signed last year, when can we expect the China Asia's futures launch in Hong Kong? Well, we're all waiting uh, for that approval, uh, hopefully at some point in the future. Um, I think that uh, the uh, conditions are getting uh, better, you know, to be able to get that approval from mainland China. Uh, I, we believe that China now has a very strong interest in supporting and encouraging the development of Hong Kong as an international financial and development center. And that could potentially be a good window uh, for us to be able to uh, launch that contract. Any, any indication of timeline? Not at all. We, we don't have uh, any, any direct uh, uh, indication yet, uh, but uh, clearly our conversations 
uh, seems to be encouraging. You know, so we're cautiously optimistic, but obviously it's not over until until we actually are able to uh, to see the launch by Hong Kong exchanges on on this great uh, contract. We do tell you that the number of clients that have been asking for this is uh, is increasing dramatically. And now with the, uh, the, the consultations and the conversations that we have had with clients around the world regard, regarding this new license uh, to the 37 futures contracts in Hong Kong, the, uh, the level of interest has uh, spiked dramatically in, in the possibility of uh, a share futures contract on MSCI uh, in Hong Kong. I want to draw your attention now to ESG, and you're obviously very passionate about that. As we all settle into a new normal as a result of the pandemic, are you seeing any new trends in ESG investing? For sure. Uh, I think what has happened since the pandemic started uh, is uh, we have witnessed a significant outperformance of ESG portfolios relative to any other kind of portfolio in the world. Uh, I, I think that you know, investors have began to uh, see and identify that the best governed companies, the ones that are protecting the environment, and especially the ones that are, uh, that, that are very conscious of their social issues and their, and their human capital issues, have, uh, have outperformed in this, uh, during this period. So uh, you know, this is the area of MSCI that is the fastest growing. Uh, and it was before the pandemic, and it has accelerated since the start of the pandemic. So uh, we're very, very uh, optimistic and, uh, and encouraged to see that. And we hear that from all of our clients. The dialogue with uh, many CEOs and chief investment officers that I have among our client base, this is a, a topic de rigueur. We, in every meeting, there is a lot of discussion about this. Sometimes the whole meeting is all about ESG investing. Is this it, Henry, the pivotal moment in modern history that will finally make ESG you know, a priority for investors? Like you said, it's been growing, but it's still partly considered a bit of a niche portfolio. But is this it that will make it uh, really important? I would think so. I think it's gradually getting into the mainstream of investing. And obviously, we have been a catalyst uh, for that you know, around the world. Our objective from day one has always been to make uh, sustainable investing and ESG investing part of the mainstream of, uh, of the global investment industry. I think when you look at the uh, just two examples in the last uh, clearly three, four months, uh, the global pandemic, uh, you know, we can talk about a virus, you know, infecting us and creating so much uh, uh, loss of death and uh, anxiety and uncertainty and clearly all the economic consequences. Yeah, I think what we ought to ask ourselves is where are these pandemics coming from? How do they originate? Uh, and a lot of it is because, you know, uh, maybe not this one itself, but many other ones, they're originating from our our uh, disregard for the environment, our disregard for the planet, uh, and therefore the change of habitats of animals. Those animals need to flee, need to get closer to uh, domesticated animals, uh, like pigs and, and, and animals like that. And those animals then infect human beings, and those human beings travel much more now than, the, than they did before and infect uh, others. So that's something that, uh, that is gonna propel ESG. And obviously the second one is uh, the social issues that we are seeing all over the world, but especially in the US. Those are going to, uh, to put a huge emphasis on the social aspect of uh, sustainable investing. I'm glad you brought that up. I was just going to come to it, the social issues, what we are seeing in the US, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement. Do you think that will influence ESG investing? Are investors going to care more about how a company, you know, how committed a company is to racial equality, for example? Will they care about that? And will that influence ESG investing? And how so? I've been predicting that, especially in America, the, uh, the bigger part of uh, investing will turn out to be the social aspect. The bigger part of so sustainable investing will be the social aspect. Um, 
for a few reasons. One, clearly the issues of governance are, pretty, are very well advanced and people know them, you know, and you know what you need to do to make sure the company is very, very well governed. Um, the environment is also very direct, very understandable. People know that. And, and now it's a question of whether, uh, whether they do something about it or not. And, and the social issues are you know, a little harder because they're not uh, one thing. You know, it's a variety of different factors. And uh, the measurement has to be uh, appropriate. Uh, but I've been predicting that. And if you think about the last you know, few, uh, few months and the last few years, uh, it, just think about the three big issues that have come out in, social, in the social norms. One is the Me Too movement in terms of uh, equality. Uh, of opportunities, equal pay, and uh, and and, uh, and uh, the encouragement and employment of women in the labor markets, mm -hmm. uh, especially in senior ranks, that has been happening with us uh, in America for a number of years now, uh, and that continues unabated. That's a social issue. The pandemic has demonstrated and will differentiate companies between the ones that care about their employees, in terms of uh, their their health, their safety. Uh, their well-being in their in their work environment and the ones that don't there will be some companies that are forcing employees to go back to work uh, maybe prematurely no wearing masks not creating social distancing and employees are hesitantly following them and that's going to make a big difference and for sure these issues of uh, incredible racial injustice and discrimination uh, it's hard to believe that in the second in the first half of the 21st century 155 years after the abolition of slavery, we're still dealing with intractable issues like that uh, in this country. So, uh, so I think that uh, that's going to therefore present another significant waves, and it's already happening, uh, whether it's in educational institutions in America, there is a big uh, awareness and conscious, consciousness. There are a lot of movements in corporate America, a lot of movements as well. And the, like, the last point that I will mention is that this is not just about a problem in the United States. You see this uh, in the UK, you see that in France with the uh, Northern Africans, you see that uh, in, even in India, you see that in Brazil, you know, with a lot of, uh, you know, the black population there, you see it all over the world. Yeah, it's time to start to change. Yeah. But you know, one issue that always comes up when you talk about ESG is the issue of compliance. How do you know a company is actually doing what it says it's doing, whether it's you know, greening their supply chains, whether it's uh, paying men and women equally, especially at MSCI, how do you verify that? Well, we at MSCI spend a huge amount of time gathering uh, hundreds of, hundreds of uh, data sources, thousands and thousands, sometimes millions of data points and uh, in order to come up to, with our ratings, half of the uh, data that goes into the creation of a rating is company disclosed data, whether it's filings with the securities commissions or filings with other government agencies or websites or, or the like, or their own disclosure. The other half and a very integral part uh, of our ratings, it comes from third party sources, whether it's courts of law, environmental agencies, blogs, uh, and, uh, and things like that, in order to then determine a complete picture. Clearly, there is a lot more disclosure that is uh, needed. Uh, but it is, you know, in a court of law, when there is a filing about a, a discrimination uh, about women, for example, in terms of pay, you know, you can capture that as to whether the company is, uh, is having equal pay with, for women and men or not. Uh, and then we need to investigate that through other sources of data as well. But that is one indication, for example, of that particular topic. Where do you draw the line? Are there certain companies or certain industries that are completely off limits for you? And what's the criteria you use to determine which ones are completely off limits? There is no country, no region, no sector, no type of issuer, whether bond or, or equity or private equity or real estate or the like or private credit, that would be off limits to uh, our ability at MSCI to create ratings of those entities. We are, we are very independent as an organization. This is an area that requires a huge amount of independence 
but it also requires a scientific methodology, a, uh, a, a very rules-based methodology, not an arbitrary one. And that's what we do. We adhere to these uh, principles. And right now, we, we rate 15,000 issuers, both equity and bonds, uh, and counting. Uh, we have plans to go into real estate, particularly for the environment and private equities and private credit. Uh, we create 1,500 ESG fixed income and equity indices. So this is a big area that we are extremely focused on uh, because it's good for the world. It's good for uh, capitalism. It's good for the free enterprise system. It's, it's very good for the better allocation of capital in the world. You went ahead with your semi-annual index review in May this year, while a lot of your competitors decided to wait, just given the volatility we've seen in the markets. How did you decide, how did COVID influence you to decide, you know, which ones to keep in and which ones to move out of your index? Well, I think COVID uh, separated uh, those exchanges from the ones that, uh, you know, were continuing to functioning appropriately. And a few of them, a handful of them that uh, shut down, uh, mostly because uh, they were, um, you know, they were in-person exchanges, in-person trading, and therefore they didn't want uh, they didn't want a proximity of people to one another. Uh, but a lot of other exchanges already had a great deal of electronic trading, you know, in their systems that they could continue. Uh, most of the exchanges in the world, there was huge amount of resiliency uh, in the technology and, and in the trading that took place, even in extremely volatile days you know, of the market. So uh, we felt, uh, and our strong bias was, that regardless of market conditions, we should rebalance the indices. Our clients expect us to do that. Now, clearly, if you, we had to take this all the way to the day of the announcement uh, and the day of the actual implementation, because in the highly unlikely event that there will be extremely tumultuous uh, of conditions uh, in which price discovery will be uh, challenged significantly, you know, we will we would have to uh, to pause. Uh, but other than that, uh, we we feel an obligation to maintain these indices in good markets and bad markets. And lastly, we want to talk to you about your emerging markets index. And here in Asia, there's a lot of curiosity about Vietnam, and people want to know why isn't Vietnam on it? What's holding you back from including Vietnam on it, uh, in it? Given that Vietnam is continuing to grow in importance, especially amid, amidst the U.S.-China uh, trade tensions, so why not Vietnam? When could we see Vietnam in it? Yeah, first of all, uh, we have always a strong interest and including more countries into our indices than not. Uh, it's one simple uh, reason. More choice, more diversification will benefit our clients around the world. If there is one free launch in global investing, uh, it's diversification. You know, the more choice you have, the better risk-adjusted returns. So uh, we monitor a lot of countries very closely, uh, including Vietnam. Uh, we have our sights on, on them to see how much progress uh, they can make. Our team is in discussions with them. Uh, there's a number of things that need to happen. Obviously, that uh, we're, work, we're working and talking to them. We're talking to our, our global investor clients as well. Uh, we would love to see them you know, make those changes uh, in order for them to, uh, to be part of the MSCI indices and therefore part of the family of investable investing uh, according to uh, MSCI and our clients. So when you decide to include them, please come back and tell us first. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we have to tell everyone at the same time, but I'm sure you're going to see, see it uh, well in advance because we always put the country in review before we make any actions. Right? Thank you so much for your time, Henry Fernandez, Chairman and CEO of MSCI. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you.
Right, that was my colleague Malika Kapoor speaking to someone who is arguably the most uh, powerful man in global financial markets. Now, you heard them both discussing the outlook for ESG. Let's check in on the results of our second polling question. As a reminder, the question was, will investors commit more money to ESG? Your three options were yes, as long as the returns are there, perhaps, but the returns need to improve, or not really, it will remain a niche portfolio priority and the results are in 45 percent of you say yes as long as the returns are there 41 percent not far off say perhaps but those returns need improving all right let's move on to our next interview for this particular day we know that the coronavirus has of course changed many things around the world very dramatically one of those things is potentially the world of health care as well as the way that we do business on a day-to-day -day basis we're going to speak to the head of a company that has health care fintech and a wide variety of other interests across china and the wider asia region as well i caught up with jessica tan the group co-ceo of ping an i asked her what her business, her healthcare business at Ping An, had learned from the coronavirus outbreak. Take a listen. Yes, healthcare is a big, um, compare, uh, healthcare ecosystem is a very big thing for us. Um, we have four key units here from Good Doctor and Online uh, Health uh, to Smart Healthcare in our Smart City, uh, which looks at basically technology enablement for uh, the offline providers like hospitals and doctors. Uh, we have a third unit, Health Connect, which does social health insurance. Uh, and then uh, we have a fourth unit, which is really our uh, research institute uh, in health tech and bio research. Um, what, what really struck us uh, during this um, very unusual time uh, during COVID is actually uh, how much um, actually potential I think technology can have uh, in improving accessibility, um, efficiency, effectiveness, and affordability for healthcare. Um, and, we, and we feel that this is the right direction that we've been doing. Right? I'll, give, I'll give three examples um, just to make it a little bit more concrete. The first one is in terms of uh, you know, helping cities to have better ability to predict and manage uh, you know, crises like, like as, uh, such as COVID-19. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, how they, you know, it, at the beginning, you know, being able to accurately predict, right, um, you know, what the level of infection um, might be in different districts was very critical. Uh, we were fortunate in our healthcare, um, health tech research institute to help with about, I think, over uh, 30 cities, um, you know, to help them with how to do this. We're about 90 nine percent accurate a day in advance, so 98%, um, you know, seven days in advance, uh, which help them to measure better responses, right? So I think that's, that's one on delivering of healthcare um, uh, kind of uh, overall provision. I think the second example would be around uh, accessibility to users. And as you know, um, during COVID, a lot of the uh, small illnesses like flus or if your, your child has a fever, et cetera, people don't really want to go to the hospitals, um, which is something that we've been pushing for years actually uh, with the um, setup of Good Doctor. And we found that I, uh, during the COVID um, situation at the beginning, uh, our basically online consultation increased about nine times. Um, we look, and I think that basically changed a kind of a consumer adoption or behavior, something that might have taken years to do so, um, basically will compress in a few months. Uh, and hopefully that's something that will continue to improve. Our, our belief is that actually about 34% of all the illnesses can be done uh, much more effectively and affordably actually online. Uh, so I think that's one positive thing that we see going forward. And then thirdly is I think actually to the healthcare system itself, right? If you look at the doctors, right, uh, in many of the countries, right, in China, I mean, the, the diagnostics, um, uh, ability to diagnose uh, the, the, the virus, so actually the clinical path, um, you know, kept updating. Right? It was uh, difficult for any normal doctors to even do so. Um, we have this um, ASPOP clinical decision support system that we provide to about 37, uh, uh, three, uh, 370,000 doctors um, you know, across uh, you know, 10,000 in my medical institution, which help them better diagnose, right? including medical imaging, which is one of the diagnostics methods and stuff. So I think we were encouraged by some of these things to have, I think we could see how technology could help improve the effectiveness uh, and accessibility for the healthcare system, be it around uh, you know, to the government, to the consumers, or even to the professionals themselves. 
Uh, speaking of technology helping, so I know that Health Connect is working with the Chinese government as part of the new social welfare system. Do you see scope for further cooperation there given the events of 2020? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. I think longer trends, uh, not just in China, but more broadly, healthcare um, expenditure, rising costs is, is, a, is a definite trend, right? I think in China, when you looked at the aging population, the increasing affluence, et cetera, this is definitely a trend that will continue to happen. We have about one, close to about a one US dollar trillion uh, healthcare expenditure. Um, now, in terms of affordability, now most of it is provided by the social health insurance in China right now. Um, and private health insurance is a very small percentage, a single uh, percentage digits, right? So if you look at um, folks in critical illness, actually 44% of them uh, of the expenditure is self-paid, right? So as the costs increase, um, you know, it's gonna outpace actually the average affluence level, uh, and that's gonna cause problems on how they can afford that uh, going forward. So we do see lots of room, one of the reasons we created Health Connect. On one hand is to take our technology to help them manage better uh, in terms of what are the right uh, healthcare costs that you should manage. Uh, so we're, we're, we've been building with the government on the various diagnostics related groups on setting the different standards so there's no over treatment and fraud and abuse. Uh, on the other hand also, in the long term, we believe that you know, that's good models whereby public um, social health insurance as well as private health insurance can be combined better, particularly for different segments and chronic disease, which basically constitute the bulk of the cost. Uh, 2020 was such an unusual year in, in many different respects. I'm just wondering if the crisis caused you to reevaluate any of your existing businesses or technology investments. Are there any that you think in light of recent events maybe need to be retooled or reworked or reconsidered? Um, no, actually, I think uh, even as a very digital uh, kind of our organization has only made us um, stronger that actually we were in the step in the right direction. In fact, we felt we were not fast enough. Um, I think, um, you know, it, it, this crisis actually stretched us uh, very, very much because uh, even in our remote um, work arrangements, typically we plan for maybe 10%, 20% of the people working remote. And we are already one of the better uh, organizations to have that plan. I think uh, during Chinese New Year this time, uh, you know, we were forced within five days to figure out how to get 1.4 million working, you know, completely remotely at home. Uh, so, you know, there were enough even servers uh, to, to go around. I think that really stretched us. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it took us about a month to really get everything in place. Uh, but it, it actually forces us to be more aggressive. Uh, if anything, you know, we were, we had to get over a million agents to do their sales meetings in the morning in the branches uh, completely online. Uh, so we were hosting like 17,000 of such you know, sessions uh, every day, uh, you know, getting everyone work remotely uh, and even for customers, uh, instead of meeting them face to face, we started experimenting whereby, you know, we would do like video chats with them uh, and brought in specialists. So if anything, I think it actually gave us confidence and the you know, persistence that this is something in the right direction that we need it for ourselves as well tech businesses. So we're going to double down and actually accelerate that. So one of the other challenges besides business continuity this year is, of course, the economic slowdown, the potential hit to uh, the business itself. Lloyd's of London has estimated that the COVID crisis could cost the global insurance industry, I think, something like uh, $200 billion. What are you doing to offset that hit to the business? So definitely, um, we, like many other businesses, are uh, hit by uh, the COVID impact. Uh, I think for us, uh, we were fortunate in the sense that I think as um, as financial services insurers, we were relatively less hit, but, you know, it doesn't take away the fact that, you know, our agents can't meet people face-to-face, -face, so the effectiveness is definitely lowered a bit. Um, our credit uh, businesses, uh, you know, some of them, particularly to SMEs, et cetera, will be impacted by a little bit. Um, and of course, the investment, overall investment background, so we're definitely hit by a little bit. I think one of the things that we... Uh, the way we think about this too, I think one, of course, lessening the impact, um, you know, so uh, we've been taking various measures uh, in terms of risk mitigation and stuff. Uh, so we're quite diversified. So, you know, I think we're relatively quite muted in that sense. Mm -hmm. I think on the other, uh, on the other area, we looked at this also um, areas of opportunities where we can accelerate some of the growth, right? Uh, so I, I mentioned the course about health, uh, about some of tech businesses, for example, um, in our One Connect, which is our FinTech, uh, subsidiary, uh, you know, 
during this period for them actually we had dozens of financial institutions reaching out to us proactively because they needed the tools to help them accelerate that better um, so I think it is an, also an opportunity for us I think to to accelerate so in the lot we look at this longer term um, you know that uh, you know, will grow together with the industry well, Pagan does have so many different businesses. You have really good insight into the overall health of the Chinese consumer, the Chinese economy at the moment. Give us some insight, some color on what you're seeing at the moment. Are things beginning to recover? Yeah, um, so I think China is very fortunate in the sense that um, we started going through the crisis first. Uh, so, you know, experiencing right around, you know, end of January, early Feb. Uh, so uh, actually, is you know, much of the things have already resumed by now. I mean, I just got back from Singapore uh, last month. Um, you know, if I look at how Singapore and Southeast Asia is doing, it's really going through the first kind of maybe in the mid second wave, um, where a lot of things are in the lockdown and stuff. Uh, but if you look at the rest of China, um, it's resumed quite a lot because, um, and I think, uh, so we expect the second half uh, for China to be relatively strong rel uh, relative to the rest. Um, you know, uh, of the world, uh, but it's going to be still muted. Um, you know, for, for starters, you can, there's a few signs that you can look at. One is that much of the growth now, um, I think supply driven growth is a bit stronger than the demand side driven growth. I mean, if you look at the main numbers, uh, the industrial output in, increase is actually a lot more year on year, um, you know, increase, but the retail is still about down by about uh, minus 2.8% year on year. Uh, so I think uh, right now you get a little bit more supply than the um, than the demand. Uh, the second sign you can look at is also from a, uh, definitely trade is impacted, um, but and then but imports is going to be a little, uh, growth is going to be stronger than the exports side. Um, and again, kind of makes sense because um, you know there's not much to export out, but you know uh, China is to continue to grow that side. So I think we looked at this cautious. Uh, it's probably a little bit better. Uh, our own uh, research institute estimate about three percent real GDP growth uh, in China this year. Um, so we continue to watch out um, very cautiously. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the situation in Hong Kong, because of course you are a Hong Kong listed company, but you are based over the border in Shenzhen. How are you thinking about the future of the city at the moment? Do you remain committed to Hong Kong? Do you still see it as a sort of gateway into the Chinese market? Yeah, I think Hong Kong has some very unique uh, advantages, uh, you know, historically. It's still a very important financial center and also a very, uh, one of the very important gateways uh, to China, right? I mean, if you look at any of the numbers, be it, let's say, um, you know, offshore and the transactions, or even uh, if you look at the, um, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, the foreign investments, um, you know, uh, onshore, I think about 50% of the RMB bond, overseas RMB bond turnover in China actually comes through Hong Kong. So I think it still remains a very important financial center. And then secondly, I'm encouraged also by the Greater Bay Area Development. Uh, I think it's a very real uh, uh, right direction, you know, instead of cities competing with each other, um, you know, really looking at different cities and their relative strengths right? um, and creating a much more regional bay area type of uh, development. And I, I, I personally believe a lot in that. As of course, lots of ins market infrastructure to make sure that it can really cross through, be it, you know, be it uh, currency or you know, uh, rules and regulations and stuff. But this is something that I think will work in the longer term. Uh, and therefore, we remain committed uh, to Hong Kong. We have businesses in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, as you know, we have one of the virtual banking license. Uh, we have some of our insurance and banking operations there. So we remain committed uh, for the long term. Uh, and hopefully, we'll grow together with the Bay Area. I wanted to ask you about your technology investments as well. Of course, we have seen a lot of tech valuations take a big hit during the market turmoil. How are you thinking about those at the moment? How do you evaluate potential investments? And also, how do you judge their success? I think the, um, my personal view is that the tech investment industry is gonna be much more um, uh, diverging. I think you will see some that are real stars because they are very getting, more and more scarce value. Uh, I think you'll find that if you go with uh, having a sufficient scale, you know, a unique and sustainable and profitable model, uh, you're going to find very few, right? So I think you will see actually, you know, diverging kind of outcomes. Um, our own investments have been uh, quite fortunate. Uh, you know, if you look at, I mean, obviously, Good Doctor has actually increased by like four times this year uh, in market cap. Uh, even One Connect uh, has increased by about 90% since it listed. 
in New York uh, end of last year. Uh, so I think we remain encouraged that if you work on the right model in the long term, it's going to be it's going to be um, right. Um, my my only um, kind of worry is that um, you know lots of investors kind of follow the wind in some sense. Um, I think if you look at, uh, you know, it's very different investing in tech businesses than in the mature industries, right? We look at profitability and stuff like that. So it requires pretty savvy uh, investors who understands the under the business model itself and the economics. And it's not about, you know, how much you lose, et cetera. It's whether it's a sustainable and really address a real need. Uh, and I think this will seep out some of the ones that were more like they have a nice tagline, but, you know, they're not really adding much value nor is sustainable. Uh, so I think this will hopefully diverge much more, but there's a lot of uh, very tech savvy institutional investors uh, that, that are holding up actually the right valuations for different types of uh, markets. And so I think it will calibrate after a while. Mm. Well, I wanted to ask you about fintech in particular. If we could zoom in on that at the moment. Uh, the coronavirus crisis clearly tested the digital banking capabilities of a lot of financial firms. Uh, what did you learn from that experience? Did it expose any gaps in Ping An's own fintech? Do you see additional opportunities there, perhaps? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the fintech in the uh, uh, industry have been focused on customer interactions, right, doing servicing and stuff like that. I think this COVID virus stretches us to be a lot more complete and deep uh, in the things. So I think uh, it covers basically three areas. Um, uh, changing the way that it's not about just online sales, but it's online and offline integrated together. So it was really enabling how your sales act agents actually work and not just having a mobile banking app. Um, so I think that would be that one area will accelerate. Um, the second area is actually uh, how our professionals work together. Financial services is a very specialized industry. I mean, if you're risk experts, even you know, different product risk experts, right? And each one of them are very siloed in their own areas. Now, one of the things that technology can do is actually enable, it's not to replace them, uh, but actually to enable that much better, right? So we, we figure out like, um, we've been experimenting that for, for about two years, um, like our sales, uh, our contact center agents, our uh, claims risk adjusters, you know, basically working alongside and not to replace them, but to help them institutionalize that knowledge better, right? In various AI models. So I think that's gonna accelerate because it forces them the whole disaggregation of the value chain, you can get these people much, working much better, right? Uh, because of the model system. And then I think the third area is about thinking whose customers are this, right? It used to be that financial services kind of fight each other on customers. Um, in, in the internet world, that's a very, um, it's a meaningless discussion. A user is a user. It can be yours and can be mine, right? So I think it talks about much more open collaboration um, ecosystem. Now, everyone kind of talks about that, but nobody has really find a sustainable model to do that. And I think um, we were experimenting with something. Uh, for example, one of the, uh, one Connect built a blockchain SME platform in Guangzhou province during the COVID virus, um, whereby, you know, instead we, we offered our technology and then worked with the government, um, you know, getting government subsidies as well as 200 over financial institutions on the platform. And then for the SMEs who needed this, uh, created risk models to help disperse, better assess and, you know, uh, disperse the loans amongst all. I was very encouraged in less than five months, um, you know, we have 33,000 SMEs um, and then over, I think, 20 billion yuan of uh, loans, 55% were dispersed. Right? And I think that's a kind of a new model whereby, you know, uh, technology kind of brings financial institutions together instead of competing with each other uh, because each one is slightly different and that it can be shared uh, across uh, with some of the capabilities. Uh, so I think these three areas, are, I think something that uh, through the COVID kind of changed and accelerated uh, some of the changes. All right. Well, Jessica, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for being with us today. That's Jessica Tan, the group co-CEO of Ping An. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tracy. Okay, we're going to be shifting gears right now. We're actually going to hear from some of Bloomberg Intelligence's analysts about one of the consequences of the coronavirus outbreak. It's something that I was just discussing with Jessica Tan. That is the potential to hasten a digital shift that's arguably already been underway in the economy for many years. So let's hear from the BI analysts. They are Matthew Bloxham and Julie Sherriel. Here they are. Hello, my name is Matthew Bloxham. I'm the lead for technology, media and telecom research for Bloomberg Intelligence for the EMEA region. 
Now, work from home has clearly exploded um, through the pandemic lockdowns, uh, but really the opportunity for technology companies depends on where it settles as restrictions ease. Uh, and to understand that potential, um, we've looked at some data um, that's made available by Eurostat, which is the Statistics Bureau of the European Commission. Uh, and what you can see in this chart um, is the proportion of the workforce that historically has worked from home uh, and the kind of opportunity set as we see it for where that could go uh, in the longer term. And essentially we see that potentially work from home uh, could double from its historic levels going forward. Now what you can see that the, the blue bars show you the percentage of the labour force in Europe uh, that historically has been working from home. The dark blue bars represent people that work from home or that their home is their usual place of work and the light blue bars uh, represents the, um, the labour force um, who occasionally work from home. Uh, now together that adds up to about 16% uh, of the total European workforce, about 5% usually work from home, another 11% occasionally work from home. Now the yellow markers represent what we see uh, as the opportunity set uh, for work from home going forward and that essentially represents the proportion of the labour force uh, that works in service industries that we see as um, kind of conducive to working from home uh, and what we see for Europe as a whole is that that opportunity set could be 30% of the labour force, so roughly double the historic average, but that the spread is quite different across European countries. You can see on the left hand side of this chart that countries like Sweden and the Netherlands uh, are already operating at a level that's quite close to that kind of maximum opportunity set. But then you see countries like Norway, which is about two thirds of the way to the right, where current uh, historic levels of work from home are a long way below the opportunity set. Um, so, and actually what's quite interesting is that for the big European markets, so the UK, Germany, France, uh, Italy and Spain, there's also quite a substantial upside potential there if working practices do shift um, as lockdowns ease. And that could be a great opportunity for technology companies in the region. Now how close we get to that maximum potential depends very much uh, on how uh, employers shift their work from home policies. We've seen that Twitter um, and Facebook have taken the lead globally in, in how they're offering their staff the opportunity to work from home permanently, but we have started to see similar moves from big European companies. For example, Barclays and WPP, the ad agency, their CEOs have both acknowledged that there's going to be a permanent shift in how people work going forward. Uh, and we've seen Telenor, the Norwegian telecom carrier, offer its uh, employees opportunities to permanently work from home going forward. So the shifts are happening. So we will definitely, I think, see uh, that historic average of kind of 16% 6, or so go up uh, and it could quite easily get into the 20 to 30% range, which creates quite a substantial opportunity for technology companies in Europe. So the digital transformation opportunities for the technology sector in Europe um, really enabled by work from home uh, but that kind of work from home opportunity is only really enabled um, if home broadband connections are working well. Now there were definitely con some concerns in Europe um, when lockdowns first kicked in that the networks might not be able to cope with the additional demands being made of them uh, and we saw moves for example to ask Netflix and other streaming platforms to cut uh, their streaming throughput by about 25% to help protect networks so people could work from home effectively. Uh, and I think since then actually there's been very few incidents uh, of network problems reported across the region. Uh, but we thought it'd be interesting to kind of dig a little bit deeper and see what the home broadband experience has been for people at an individual level. And to do that, uh, we carried out a survey of London-based staff of Bloomberg, um, who are typically quite intensive users of home broadband connections, to see how their experience had been. And the results of that survey were quite interesting. Now about 575 people took part in the survey um, and we found that overall 80% uh, of respondents were either somewhat or very satisfied with how their home broadband connection had performed 
during lockdown in the UK. And that's despite the fact that 62% of those respondents said they'd experienced some issues uh, with their connection during lockdown. Now those issues were typically either slow speeds um, or unstable connections, but overall they weren't kind of substantial enough to kind of detract from people's uh, perception uh, of the experience they were getting. But you know, we did see that there's a kind of um, a significant minority of people who've been frustrated enough by the home broadband experience to consider switching uh, provider. About 26% of the respondents said that they were either considering or planning to switch provider as a result of their home broadband experience in lockdown. And we found that typically people were more inclined to think about switching if they had a slow broadband connection. So typically a connection that was below 20 megabytes megabits per second. Uh, we also saw, I think linked to that, that about 28% of respondents said that they were planning to upgrade the speed of the connection they had either with their current or a new provider. Um, so that's kind of encouraging, I think, for the sales opportunity within the telecom industry. Uh, what was quite interesting too uh, was that Hyperoptic, which is a niche full fiber only provider in the UK, had by far and away the most satisfied users within our survey. And again, I think that's kind of reassuring and kind of underpins uh, this shift towards full fiber we're seeing. So I think overall for the industry, it's quite reassuring for telecom carriers who are investing billions of dollars as we speak in these new expensive full fiber networks that there's definitely as a result of the lockdown experience, um, a growing shift towards upgrading to faster connections, which are more expensive, so will generate more revenue for the industry, and that will in turn help to pay and accelerate the payback uh, on these expensive new networks that are going into the ground across Europe as we speak. So I hope that's been an interesting insight into the work we've been doing here in, in London. Um, you can contact me, Matthew Bloxham, via the terminal, and you can find out more about our research at BIGO. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julie Sheriel, and I'm a senior analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. I cover equities in the fintech and payment sector, but I'm here today representing our entire US telecom, media, and tech team. TMT is one of the clear beneficiaries of the behavioral shifts brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. This shock has accelerated a digital transformation already underway, and we think the changes it's brought are here to stay. I'm going to touch on several topics in the next few minutes, but you can find them all in the digital theme book that we've sent to you. The first segment to see a pickup at the start of the pandemic was e-commerce. Most stores closed and people sought to avoid the stores that were open. Because of the growth here, our retail team expects e-commerce penetration to double to 22% of U.S. retail sales by 2024. The first wave of coronavirus drove Walmart e-commerce sales up 74% and Target's up 141%. Food and beverage e-commerce will lead the pack and Amazon added 60% to its capacity here. Our analysts see it going from 60 billion to 160 billion in sales by 2024, driven by Walmart, Kroger, and Albertsons. And importantly, shopping online will stick. A MasterCard survey in May found that 47% of consumers expected to shop less in stores even after the virus subsides. Plus, store closings and bankruptcies are on the rise. Greater use and adoption of e-commerce is one factor driving digital payments. Another is a desire to avoid cash. It's just seen as the least hygienic payment option. So contactless payments at the point of sale are quickly replacing cash. Volume on tap to pay contactless cards jumps 20% for these already this year. But the bigger money-making opportunity here is with digital wallets. We see payment volume here growing 27% annually through 2023, which means activity will jump two and a half fold. In the case of in-store payments, the primary digital wallets are Apple Pay, Google Pay, and Samsung Pay. Their goal is less about generating payments revenue, considering how large they already are, but more about driving handset stickiness and utility. But Samsung Pay just announced several banking type services, and Apple offers steeper rewards on the Apple Card if you use it through Apple Pay. The second type of digital wallet is the P2P app. That's the original PayPal and the more recent Venmo 
and Square's Cash App, which suddenly can claim 27 to 37 million users each. They started out offering mostly free peer-to-peer -peer payments, but they're shifting their focus to other services that can be monetized, like debit card issuance, Bitcoin and fractional share trading, and direct deposit. We think direct deposit is a killer app for these companies. If they become the gatekeeper of their customers' main funds, like payroll, then they become a hub for all of that customer's financial activity. And that's where the real revenue kicks in. Cash App has a jump on Venmo here, but we think Venmo will ramp up aggressively this year. The third type of wallet is an e-commerce wallet that comes from marketplaces like Amazon and Facebook and retailers like Walmart and Starbucks. So these are evolving from a checkout convenience to a driver of sales. They hold rewards and they capture data on customer behavior that makes incentives offered even better. PayPal started out as a P2P service but has evolved to the leading e-commerce wallet. It has 300 million users, has its pay button on 70% of online merchant websites, and 89% of consumers say they've used it in the past year. As a pure play, it's in the sweet spot of the trend toward digital payments. Let's turn to some other areas of TMT and digital transformation. We have lots of interesting research here, but let me just give you a quick recap. Moving to the cloud is the cornerstone of digital transformation. And we expect enterprises to invest more aggressively once the pandemic subsides. Near term, this is about productivity and collaboration applications like Zoom and Slack and RingCentral. But it's moving to commerce and customer service solutions from Shopify and Salesforce, for instance. By 2021, we see companies investing in IT infrastructure to move to the public cloud with the likes of Microsoft and Amazon. The secular shift to the cloud, plus an increase in remote work, will drive growth of cloud-based security providers, especially as breaches get more sophisticated. So pure play cloud companies such as CloudStrike, Okta, and Zscaler could grow three to four times faster than the overall security market. And more cloud-focused M&A is likely. Dramatic workforce changes with office closures have also put a spotlight on gaps in enterprise IT architectures. And companies are now under pressure to quickly catch up. They'll tap Cisco, Arista, and others after years of underinvesting. One sector battled, battered by the COVID-19 is media. From closed theaters to theme parks, to sports being canceled and ad spending being pulled. But the pandemic has also accelerated the shift to digital media. Major streaming services added at least 50 million subscribers since January. And while Netflix added 16 million in the first quarter, traditional pay TV operators lost about 2 million. Nielsen reported that time spent streaming more than doubled from a year ago. And I guess this presentation is adding to those streaming hours. I hope our digital transformation here was worth your minutes and your bandwidth. Enjoy the rest of the conference. You can, of course, find all the research from Bloomberg Intelligence on the terminal now. I'm sad to say we are nearing the end of the third day of our Global Invest event. But before we go, uh, Laura Zelenko, our senior executive editor and head of diversity for Bloomberg, is going to give us a quick snapshot of our new Voices initiative. Here it is. At the end of 2017, we decided to take a hard look at the actual numbers, both in terms of our representation and our stories, but also on our TV programming and our radio programming. And the numbers really surprised us. About 10% of our outside guests that were brought onto TV were women. I think we all can agree that the industry would be far better off for being more diverse. What we heard from the bookers was that either they said that they couldn't find the women, there weren't women in the right roles that they were looking for, or if they found the woman, the woman didn't feel comfortable going on TV. And we thought the one thing that we could actually impact was this issue of the training. And we created an initiative called New Voices in 2018 to offer four-hour one-on-one training 
for each woman that we brought in to give them some video experience, some feedback, to learn about their messaging. This is what I would say. I think quarterly earnings, we all get extremely focused on. You know, it's a really good training. And what I really learned is just understanding sometimes you may not want to answer that question and just being able to pivot to something else entirely and getting your point across. Something that really impressed me about this initiative is that it is without any expectation and the program is fully confidential. It's not necessary to go on Bloomberg TV after this. The idea is that you will be TV ready to voice your opinions, to share your perspective. The ultimate goal from a journalistic standpoint is that we have better programming, that we have more interesting conversations at events and hearing opinions that we may not otherwise have voiced. The only way to really achieve those goals is to have that representation uh, within the financial news. So we've more than doubled the percentage of women experts on our TV and radio to over 21%. Why do you think tech executives are putting their money and their muscle behind this now? I see the difference when we have more female voices on our show. There are new ideas, new insights. Anyone really who's looking to grow professionally in their career is a fantastic opportunity to take up. Okay, that's going to conclude the third day of our Bloomberg Invest Global event here in Asia. Now, I should remind you, this is, of course, a global event. The clue is in the name after all, and you can stay tuned for three-day sessions in the Middle East, followed by London, and eventually concluding in New York. Each of those events is going to begin at 1 p.m. in the local time, so do try to catch those. And thank you so much for being with us here on Invest Global in Asia. I'm Tracy Alloway. Thanks again.